You are listening to the Auditory Entertainment's production of Black Amazon of Mars by Leigh Brackett. Performed by Miranda Johnson and Ryan Johnson. Part 4 It was past noon. He had climbed high towards the saddle of the pass. Kashat lay small below him, and he could see now the pattern of the gorges cut ages deep into the living rock that carried the spring torrents of the watershed around the mighty ledge on which the city was built. The pass itself was channeled, but only by its own snows and melting ice. It was too high for a watercourse. Nevertheless, Stark thought a man might find it hard to stay alive if he were caught there by the thaw. He had seen nothing of Balin. The gods knew how many hours start he had. Stark imagined him, scrambling wild-eyed over the rocks, driven by the same madness that had sent Thanis up to the castle to call down destruction on Kyra's head. The sun was brilliant, but without warmth. Stark shivered, and the icy wind blew strong. The cliffs hung over him, vast and sheer and crushing, and the narrow mouth of the pass was before him. He would go no farther. He would turn back now. But he did not. He began to walk forward into the gates of death. The light was dim and strange at the bottom of that cleft. Little veils of mist crept and clung between the ice and the rock, thickened, became more dense as he went farther and farther into the pass. He could not see, and the wind spoke with many tongues, piping in the crevices of the cliffs. The steps of the earth man slowed and faltered. He had known fear in his life before. But now, he was carrying the burden of two men's terrors, Ban Kruak and his own. He stopped, enveloped in the clinging mist. He tried to reason with himself that Ban Kruak's fears had died a million years ago, that Otar had come this way and lived, and Balin had come also. But the thin veneer of civilization sloughed away and left him with the naked bones of the truth. His nostrils twitched to the smell of evil, the subtle, unclean taint that only a beast, or one as close to it as he, can sense and know. Every nerve was a point of pain, raw with apprehension, an overpowering recognition of danger, hidden somewhere, mocking at him, made his very body change draw in upon itself and flatten forward, so that when at last he went on again, he was more like a four-footed thing than a man walking upright. Infinitely wary, silent, moving surely over the ice and the tumbled rock, he followed Balin. He had ceased to think. He was going now on sheer instinct. The pass led on and on, it grew darker, and in the dim, uncanny twilight there were looming shapes that menaced him, and ghostly wings that brushed him, and a terrible stillness that was not broken by the eerie voices of the wind, rock and mist and ice. Nothing that moved or lived, and yet the sense of danger deepened, and when he paused the beating of his heart was like thunder in his ears. Once. Far away, he thought he heard the echoes of a man's voice crying. But he had no sight of Balin. The pass began to drop, and the twilight deepened into a kind of sickly night. On and down, more slowly now, crouching, slinking, heavily oppressed, tempted to snarl at boulders and tear at wraiths of fog. He had no idea of the miles he had traveled. But the ice was thicker now, the cold intense. The rock walls broke off sharply. The mist thinned. The pallid darkness lifted to a clear twilight. He came to the end of the gates of death.
Stark stopped. Ahead of him, almost blocking the end of the pass, something dark and high and massive loomed in the thinning mists. It was a great cairn, and upon it sat a figure facing outward from the gates of death, as though it kept watch over whatever country lay beyond. The figure of a man in antique Martian armor. After a moment, Stark crept towards the cairn. He was still almost all savage, torn between fear and fascination. He was forced to scramble over the lower rocks of the cairn itself. Quite suddenly, he felt a hard shock and a flashing sensation of warmth that was somehow inside his own flesh and not in any tempering of the frozen air. He gave a startled leap forward and whirled, looking up into the face of the mailed figure with the confused idea that it had reached down and struck him. It had not moved, of course, and Stark knew with no need of anyone to tell him that he looked into the face of Ban Kruak. It was a face made for battles and for ruling, the bony ridges harsh and strong, the hollows under them worn deep with years. Those eyes, dark shadows under the rusty helm, had dreamed high dreams, and neither age nor death had conquered them. And even in death, Ban Kruak was not unarmed. Clad as for battle in his ancient mail, he held upright between his hands a mighty sword. The pommel was a ball of crystal, large as a man's fist, that held within it a spark of intense brilliance. The little blinding flame throbbed with its own force, and the sword blade blazed with a white, cruel radiance. Ban Kruak, dead but frozen to eternal changelessness by the bitter cold. Sitting here upon his cairn for a million years and warding forever the inner end of the gates of death as his ancient city of Kashat warded the outer. Stark took two cautious steps closer to Ban Kruak and felt again the shock and the flaring heat in his blood. He recoiled, satisfied. The strange force in the blazing sword made an invisible barrier across the mouth of the pass. Protected Ban Kruak himself. A barrier of short waves, he thought. Of the type used in deep therapy. Having no heat in themselves, but increasing the heat in the body's cells by increasing their vibration. But these waves were stronger than any he had known before. A barrier. A wall of force closing the inner end of the gates of death. A barrier that was not designed against man. Stark shivered. He turned from the somber, brooding form of Ban Kruak, and his eyes followed the gaze of the dead king, out beyond the cairn. He looked across this forbidden land within the gates of death. At his back was the mountain barrier. Before him, a handful of miles to the north, the terminus of the polar cap rose like a cliff of bluish crystal soaring up to touch the early stars. Locked in between those two titanic walls was a great valley of ice. White and glimmering that valley was, and very still, and very beautiful. The ice shaped gracefully into curving domes and hollows, and in the center of it stood a dark tower of stone. A cyclopean bulk that Stark knew must go down an unguessable distance to its base on the bedrock. It was like the tower in which Kamar had died, but this one was not a broken ruin. It loomed with alien arrogance, and within its bulk, pallid lights flickered eerily, and it was crowned by a cloud of shimmering darkness. It was like the tower of his dread vision, the tower he had seen. Not as Eric John Stark, but as Ban Kruak. Stark's gaze dropped slowly from the evil tower to the curving ice of the valley, and the fear within him grew beyond all bounds. He had seen that, too, in his vision, 
the glimmering ice, the domes and hollows of it. He had looked down through it at the city that lay beneath, and he had seen those who came and went in the buried streets. Stark hunkered down. For a long while, he did not stir. He did not want to go out there. He did not want to go out from the grim, warning figure of Ban Kruak, with his blazing sword, into that silent valley. He was afraid, afraid of what he might see if he went there and looked down through the ice, afraid of the final dread fulfillment of his vision. But he had come after Balin, and Balin must be out there somewhere. He did not want to go, but he was himself, and he must. He went, going very softly, out towards the Tower of Stone and there was no sound in all that land. The last of the twilight had faded. The ice gleamed, faintly luminous under the stars, and there was light beneath it, a soft radiance that filled all the valley with the glow of a buried moon. Stark tried to keep his eyes upon the tower. He did not wish to look down at what lay under his stealthy feet. Inevitably, he looked the temples and the palaces glittering in the ice, level upon level going down, wells of soft light spanned with soaring bridges, slender spires rising, an endless variation of streets and crystal walls exquisitely patterned, above and below and overlapping, so that it was like looking down through a thousand giant snowflakes, a metropolis of gossamer and frost, fragile and lovely as a dream locked in the clear, pure vault of the ice. Stark saw the people of the city passing along the bright streets, their outlines blurred by the icy vault as things are half obscured by water. The creatures of vision, vaguely shining, infinitely evil. He shut his eyes and waited until the shock and the dizziness left him. Then he set his gaze resolutely on the tower and crept on over the glassy sky that covered those buried streets. Silence. Even the wind was hushed. He had gone perhaps half the distance when the cry rang out. It burst upon the valley with a shocking violence. Stark! Stark! The ice rang with it. Curving ridges picked up his name and flung it back and forth with eerie crystal voices. The echoes fled out, whispering, Stark! Stark! Until it seemed that the very mountains spoke. Stark whirled about. In the pallid gloom between the ice and the stars, there was light enough to see the cairn behind him and the dim figure atop it with the shining sword. Light enough to see Kyra and the dark knot of riders who had followed her through the gates of death. She cried his name again. Stark! Come back! Come back! The ice of the valley answered mockingly. Come back! Come back! And Stark was gripped with a terror that held him motionless. She should not have called him. She should not have made a sound in that deathly place. A man's hoarse scream rose above the flying echoes. The riders turned and fled suddenly, the squealing, hissing beasts crowding each other, floundering wildly on the rocks of the cairn, stampeding back into the pass. Kyra was left alone. Stark saw her fight the rearing beast she rode, and then flung herself out of the saddle to let it go. She came toward him, running, clad all in her black armor, the great axe swinging high. Behind you, Stark! He turned then and saw them, coming out from the Tower of Stone, the pale, shining creatures that moved so swiftly across the ice, so fleet and so swift that no man living could outrun them. He shouted to Kyra to turn back. He drew his sword and over his shoulder, he cursed her in a black fury, because he could hear her mailed feet coming on behind him. 
the gliding creatures, sleek and slender, reed-like, bending, delicate as rays, their bodies shaped from the northern rainbows of amethyst and rose. If they should touch Kyra, if their loathsome hands should touch her, Stark let out one raging cat-like scream and rushed them. The opalescent bodies slipped away beyond his reach. The creatures watched him. They had no faces, but they watched. They were eyeless, but not blind, earless, but not without hearing. The inquisitive tendrils that formed their sensory organs stirred and shifted like the petals of ungodly flowers, and the color of them was the white frost fire that dances on the snow. Go back, Kyra! But she would not go, and he knew that they would not have let her. She reached him, and they set their backs together. The Shining Ones ringed them round, many feet away across the ice, and watched the long sword and great hungry axe. And there was something in the lissome swaying of their bodies that suggested laughter. You fool, said Stark, you bloody fool. And you? answered Kyra. Oh, yes, I know about Balin, and that mad girl screaming in the palace. She told me. And you were seen from the wall, climbing to the gates of death. I tried to catch you. Why? She did not answer that. They won't fight us, Stark. Do you think we could make it back to the cairn? No, but we can try. Guarding each other's backs, they began to walk toward Ban Kruak and the pass. If they could once reach the barrier, they would be safe. Stark knew now what Ban Kruak's wall of force was built against, and he began to guess the riddle of the Gates of Death. The Shining Ones glided with them, out of reach. They did not try to bar the way. They formed a circle around the man and woman moving with them and around them at the same time, an endless weaving chain of many bodies, shining with soft jewel tones of color. They drew closer and closer to the cairn, to the brooding figure of Ban Kruak and his sword. It crossed Stark's mind that the creatures were playing with him and Kyra, yet they had no weapons. Almost he began to hope. From the tower where the shimmering cloud of darkness clung came a black crescent of force that swept across the ice field like a sickle and gathered the two humans in. Stark felt a shock of numbing cold that turned his nerves to ice. His sword dropped from his hand, and he heard Kyra's axe go down. His body was without strength, without feeling, dead. He fell and the Shining Ones glided in toward him. Twice before in his life, Stark had come near to freezing. It had been like this, the numbness and the cold, and yet it seemed that the dark force had struck rather at his nerve centers than at his flesh. He could not see Kyra, who was behind him, but he heard the metallic clashing of her mail and one small, whispered cry and he knew that she had fallen, too. The glowing creatures surrounded him. He saw their bodies bending over him, the frosty tendrils of their faces writhing as though in excitement or delight. Their hands touched him, little hands with seven fingers, deft and frail. Even his numbed flesh felt the terrible cold of their touch, freezing as outer space. He yelled, or tried to, but they were not abashed. They lifted him and bore him toward the tower, bearing his heavy weight upon their gleaming shoulders. He saw the tower loom high and higher still above him. The cloud of dark force that crowned it blotted out the stars. It became too huge and high to see it all, and then there was a low, flat arch of stone close above his face and he was inside. Straight overhead, a hundred feet, two hundred, he could not tell, was a globe of crystal, 
fitted into the top of the tower as a jewel is held in the setting. The air around it was shadowed with the same eerie gloom that hovered outside, but less dense, so that Stark could see the smoldering purple spark that burned within the globe, sending out its dark vibrations. A globe of crystal, with a heart of sullen flame. Stark remembered the sword of Ban Kruok and the white fire that burned in its hilt. Two globes, the bright-colored and the dark. The sword of Ban Kruok touched the blood with heat. The globe of the tower deadened the flesh with cold. It was the same force, but at opposite ends of the spectrum. Stark saw the cryptic controls of that glooming globe, a bank of them on a wide stone ledge just inside the tower, close beside him. There were shining ones on that ledge, tending those controls, and there were other strange and massive mechanisms there, too. Flying spirals of ice climbed up inside the tower, spanning the great stone well with spidery bridges, joining icy galleries. In some of those galleries, Stark vaguely glimpsed rigid, gleaming features, like statues of ice, but he could not see them clearly as he was carried on. He was being carried downward. He passed slits in the wall, and knew that the pallid lights he had seen through them were the moving bodies of creatures as they went up and down these high-flung, icy bridges. He managed to turn his head to look down, and saw what was beneath him. The well of the tower plunged down a good five hundred feet to bedrock, widening as it went. The web of ice bridges and the spiral ways went down as well as up, and the creatures that carried him were moving smoothly along a transparent ribbon of ice no more than a yard in width, suspended over that terrible drop. Stark was glad that he could not move just then. One instinctive start of horror could have thrown him and his bears to the brock below, and would have carried Kyra with them. Down and down gliding in utter silence along the descending spiral ribbon. The great glooming crystal grew remote above him. Ice was solid now in the slots of the walls. He wondered if they had brought Balin this way. There were other openings, wide arches like the one they had brought their captives through, and these gave stark brief glimpses of broad avenues and unguessable buildings shaped from the pellucid ice and flooded with the soft radiance that was like eerie moonlight. At length, on what Stark took to be the third level of the city, the creatures bore him through one of these archways into the streets beyond. Below him now was the translucent thickness of ice that formed the floor of this level and the roof of the level beneath. He could see the blurred tops of delicate minarets, the clustering roofs that shone like chips of diamond. Above him was an ice roof. Elfin spires rose toward it, delicate as needles. Lacy battlements and little domes, buildings star-shaped, wheel-shaped, the fantastic, lovely shapes of snow crystals, frosted over with the sparkling foam of light. The people of the city gathered along the way to watch, a living, shifting rainbow of amethyst and rose and green against the pure blue-white. And there was no least whisper of sound anywhere. For some distance they went through a geometric maze of streets, and then there was a cathedral-like building, all arched and spired, standing in the center of a twelve-pointed plaza. Here they turned and bore their captives in. Stark saw a vaulted roof, very slim and high, etched with a glittering tracery that might have been carving of an alien sort, delicate as the weavings of spiders. The feet of his bearers were silent on the icy paving. At the far end of the long vault sat seven of the Shining Ones, in high seats, marvelously shaped from the ice, and before them, gray-faced, shuddering with cold and not noticing it, drugged with the sick horror, stood Balin. He looked around once and did not speak. Stark was set on his feet, 
with Kyra beside him. He saw her face, and it was terrible to see the fear in her eyes that had never shown fear before. He himself was learning why men went mad beyond the gates of death. Chill, dreadful fingers touched him expertly. A flash of pain drove down his spine, and he could stand again. The seven who sat in the high seats were motionless, their bright tendrils stirring with infinite delicacy, as though they studied the three humans who stood before them. Stark thought he could feel a cold, soft fingering of his brain. It came to him that these creatures were probably telepaths. They lacked organs of speech, and yet they must have some efficient means of communications. Telepathy was not uncommon among the many races of the solar system, and Stark had had experience with it before. He forced his mind to relax. The alien impulse was instantly stronger. He sent out his own questing thought, and felt it brush the edges of a consciousness so utterly foreign to his own that he knew he could never probe it, even if he had the skill. He learned one thing, that the shining faceless ones looked upon him with equal horror and loathing. They recoiled from the unnatural human features, and most of all, most strongly, they abhorred the warmth of human flesh. Even the infinitesimal amount of heat radiated by their half-frozen human bodies caused the ice folk discomfort. Stark marshaled his imperfect abilities and projected a mental question to the Seven. What do you want of us? The answer came back, faint and imperfect, as though the gap between their alien minds was almost too great to bridge. And the answer was one word. Freedom! Balin spoke suddenly. He voiced only a whisper, and yet the sound was shockingly loud in that crystal vault. They have asked me already. Tell them no, Stark. Tell them no. He looked at Kyra then, a look of murderous hatred. If you turn them loose upon Kashat, I will kill you with my own hands before I die. Stark spoke again, silently, to the Seven. I do not understand. Again, the struggling, difficult thought. We are the old race, the kings of the glacial ice. Once we held all the land beyond the mountains, outside the pass, you call the gates of death. Stark had seen the ruins of the towers out on the moors. He knew how far their kingdom had extended. We controlled the ice, far outside the polar cap. Our towers blanketed the land with the dark force drawn from Mars itself, from the magnetic field of the planet. That radiation bars out heat from the sun, and even from the awful winds that blow warm from the south. So there was never any thaw. Our cities were many, and our race was great. Then came Ban Karak from the south. He waged a war against us. He learned of the secret of the crystal globes and learned how to reverse their force and use it against us. He, leading his army, destroyed our towers one by one and drove us back. Mars needed water. The outer ice was melted. Our lovely cities crumbled to nothing so that creatures like Ban Karak might have water and our people died. We retreated at the last to this, our ancient polar citadel, behind the gates of death. Even here, Ban Karak followed. He destroyed even this tower once, at the time of the thaw. But this city is founded in polar ice, and only the upper levels were harmed. 
even Van Karak could not touch the heart of the eternal polar cap of Mars. When he saw that he could not destroy us utterly, he sat himself in death to guard the gates of death with his blazing sword that we might never again reclaim our ancient dominion. That is what we mean when we ask for freedom. We ask that you take away the sword of Ban Karak, so that we may once again go out through the gates of death. Stark cried aloud, hoarsely. No! He knew the barren deserts of the south, the wastes of red dust, the dead sea bottoms, the terrible thirst of Mars, growing greater with every year of the million that had passed since Ban Kruak locked the gates of death. He knew the canals, the pitiful waterways that were all that stood between the people of Mars and extinction. He remembered the yearly release from death when the spring thaw brought the water rushing down from the north. He thought of these cold creatures going forth, building again their great towers of stone, sheathing half a world in ice that would never melt. He thought of the people of Jekra, and Vicalis, and Barrakesh, of the countless cities of the south, watching for the flood that did not come, and falling at last to mingle their bodies with the blowing dust. He said again, No, never. The distant thought voice of the seven spoke, and this time the question was addressed to Kyra. Stark saw her face. She did not know the Mars he did, but she had memories of her own. The mountain valleys of Mech, the moors, the snowy gorges. She looked at the shining ones in their high seats and said, if I take that sword, it will be to use it against you, as Ban Karak did. Stark knew that the Seven had understood the thought behind her words. He felt that they were amused. The secret of that sword was lost a million years ago, the day Ban Karak died. Neither you nor anyone knows how to use it as he did. But the sword's radiations of warmth still lock us here. We cannot approach that sword, for its vibrations of heat slay us if we do. But you warm-bodied ones can approach it, and you will do so, and take it from this place. One of you will take it. They were very sure of that. We can see a little way into your evil minds. Much we do not understand. But the mind of the large man is full of the woman's image, and the mind of the woman turns to him. Also, there is a link between the large man and the small man. Less strong, but strong enough. The voice thought of the seven finished. The large man will take away the sword for us, because he must, to save the other two. Kyra turned to Stark. They cannot force you, Stark. Don't let them. No matter what they do to me, don't let them. Balin stared at her with certain wonder. You would die to protect Kushat. Not Kashat alone, though its people, too, are human, she said, almost angrily. There are my red wolves, a wild pack, but my own, and others. She looked at Balin. What do you say? Your life against the Norlands? Balin made an effort to lift his head as high as hers and the red jewel flashed in his ear. He was a man crushed by the falling of his world, and terrified by what his mad passion had led him into, here beyond the gates of death. But he was not afraid to die. He said so, and even Kyra knew that he spoke the truth. 
but the seven were not dismayed. Stark knew that when their thought voice whispered in his mind, It is not death alone you humans have to fear, but the manner of your dying. You shall see that before you choose. End of Part 4 Part 5 coming soon. You've been listening to the Auditory Entertainment's production of Black Amazon of Mars by Leigh Bracken, performed by Miranda Johnson and Ryan Johnson. If you enjoyed this performance, please subscribe, leave a comment, or review. Thank you for listening.